This is Logan Miller with National Surgery Review, and today we're going to be talking about an abdominal wall reconstruction. I have no disclosures. To review the objectives, we're going to be looking at abdominal wall anatomy as well as abdominal hernia repair, focusing on advanced abdominal wall reconstruction. And then this falls under the miscellaneous hernias and ventral hernias in the SCORE curriculum. So just an overview, so what is a hernia? A hernia is an abnormal protrusion of an organ or tissue through a defect in its surrounding walls. Contents can be reducible, incarcerated, or strangulated. And the hernia repair is one of the most common procedures that we perform as general surgeons with, with over 700,000 hernias repaired annually. So first thing that we're gonna talk about is abdominal wall hernia. Before we talk about fixing these giant hernias, we need to have a very good understanding of the abdominal wall. So I'd like to first start out by saying that the way that you have learned your abdominal wall anatomy is completely wrong, and the way that Netter described it in his textbooks are wrong, and that's the way that most of us learn how to repair hernias, we look at textbooks. So Netter's textbook shows all three of your lateral uh, abdominal wall muscles, the internal oblique, external oblique, and transversalis muscles. And what you see is that there is a clear line that it looks like all of the muscles are stacked up upon one another, where the internal oblique, external oblique, and transversalis all terminate at the same level. This, however, is not true. If you look at the, um, the picture on the right, if you look at where the semilunaris nine is, and this represents the upper third of the abdomen in the top picture, you can clearly see the transversalis muscle is actually medial uh, to the rectus abdominis muscle and is actually about uh, undermines the rectus abdominis muscle by about 50%. So not at all as described in Netter's textbook. And as you see, as you decrease uh, in the levels and go towards the lower third of the abdomen, you see that the transversalis muscle actually does uh, reflect what Netter, uh, Netter um, shows in his textbook. And, and this is a very important concept to understand because we take advantage of this concept that the transversalis is below the rectus abdominis for a lot of these advanced abdominal wall reconstructions. So that'll come into play a little bit later when we look at how to repair some of these hernias. Um, this here um, talks about everything that I pretty much talked about already. Uh, the upper third of the abdomen, the posterior lamella, the internal oblique, and transverse uh, ab versus abdominis muscle extends medially to the uh, lini semilunaris. And the transverse abdominis muscle can be accessed through the retrorectus approach. And then as you go uh, caudad, um, that changes, um, especially once you get below the arcuate line, which is uh, right around the umbilicus, you'll notice that the uh, transversalis fascia um, becomes very thin and actually turns into peritoneum. Um, so that's a big change. So with all these different spaces and all these different places, there's a lot of different ways that you can place mesh in an individual. Um, so you have your onlay, which is on top of the muscles. Uh, you have an overlay, which extends a little bit farther on than, uh, than an onlay. An underlay goes underneath uh, everything, including the peritoneum. The retrorectus, the peritoneum or posterior sheath is closed, and the mesh uh, goes on top of that. Um, there's preperitoneal and then intramuscular, which um, in this figure here is um, what a, a tar release would be. It would be an intramuscular lay of a mesh. So operative considerations for these patients. So preoperative management is important. And I think preoperatively managing these patients as best as possible uh, sets you up for success. So for all my patients, I, I require a BMI less than 40. And if they have a BMI over 40, they have to have medical weight loss. They have to have surgical weight loss. There's very few indications for uh, emergent or urgent surg surgical repair of these large hernias. I get a nutrition evaluation on everybody, make sure their protein levels are adequate, diabetic management with an A1C less than eight prior to operation, and I check these. A smoking sensation uh, for at least four weeks needs to be done on all patients, and this is confirmed with a urine coatening test. In my practice, you really get two strikes and you're out. If you fail a coatening test two times, I will not operate on you. And the reason for that is that smoking is the biggest predictor for hernia infection and hernia recurrence in these large hernias. And I want to make sure that my patients get a great repair and do not have any complications. Um, all patients should get a preoperative CT scan to uh, assess the hernia for preoperative planning. Um, also, try to obtain all operative records as best as possible and try to figure out what they did to those hernias, whether it's a laparoscopic, a robotic, or an endoscopic approach, because Approaches that were used in the past, you may need to use a different approach to, um, to treat this hernia adequately.
Post-operative care, um, so with these large hernias, you're returning all the displaced viscera back into the abdomen. So, of course, you're going to have an increased intra-abdominal pressure. So while you're operating and closing the abdomen, you always want to make sure that you're checking what um, your uh, 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 plateau pressures are to ensure that they don't get respiratory failure um, or an abdominal uh, compartment syndrome. Um, aggressive pain management um, with PCAs, um, if those are offered at your hospital. All of my patients have an enhanced recovery pathway where I start them on clear liquids uh, pretty much immediately the day after surgery unless there is a, uh, is a protracted case or uh, there are a lot of enterotomies or um, adhesial lysis. Um, I maintain all of my drains until they're um, less than about 40 cc's per day. Uh, other uh, considerations is blood supply. So blood supply to the abdominal wall is very important, and it's important to know where your blood su supply comes from. So there's really three zones of blood supply in the abdomen. There's zone one, zone two, and zone three. For most of these procedures, we're violating zone one and zone two. So it's important to make sure this zone three area you do not violate because you can have some uh, significant issues if you compromise the vascular supply to these flaps. And we'll go over that a little bit more when, when you see how, how these procedures are done. So one app that I use, and I use on all of my abdominal wall patients, is the CEDAR app, and it's the Carolina Surgical Innovation Group. And this uses an algorithm based on these input factors over here. Many of them we talked about, diabetes, tobacco, prior hernias, entry to GI tract, abdominal infections, uh, skin flaps, and component separations. And BMI comes into play as well. And what this does, does is give you a risk of complications. And it doesn't really narrow it down to one complication. It's a complication of all things that could happen in the perioperative period. And what I do is I use this as an education tool for my parent, uh, to, for my patients to really show what are their modifiable risk factors and what we can do to help reduce the risk of a complication in them. And really the main things that, that, that are really modifiable are the diabetes, the tobacco, and the BMI. Um, for some of these patients, if they're able to go a gastric bypass or a sleeve gastrectomy, we can cure their diabetes. And as a result of that procedure, they have to be off tobacco products and we fix their BMI. So really uh, a bariatric surgery in a lot of these patients makes a lot of sense and, and, and really helps uh, improve the outcomes. So large hernias result as a loss of abdominal domain where the abdominal contents can no longer uh, be can no longer fit in the abdominal cavity. And the main causes are really surgery, damage control surgery, peritonitis, repeat laparotomies, obesity and smoking are risk factors, but typically um, we see these large hernias are a result of prior surgeries. Um, the natural rigidity of the abdominal wall is compromised in these patients, so you'll sometimes see uh, respiratory dysfunction with some of this uh, with paradoxical motion. And you'll see in some of the pictures I'll show you later that you, you can clearly see how that could occur. Um, component separations, what they do is they recreate the linea alba through medialization of the rectus muscles, and it uh, maintains a, an appropriate physiologic tension on the repair. Um, I consider some form of uh, uh, component separation uh, with defects that are 8 to 10 centimeters in length, and that's because uh, these uh, repairs have high tension, and these high tension repairs have a high risk of failure. Uh, for these procedures, you're really stealing donor function to obtain a recipient site tissue coverage, and that's something uh, important to remember. Um, as far as advancements that we, we typically see, so a retrorectus on both sides typically gives you about a two centimeter advancement. Um, if you're going to do some of these uh, larger component separations, whether it's an anterior or posterior, you can expect about a unilateral five centimeter in the upper abdomen, 10 centimeters in the middle abdomen, and three centimeters in the inferior abdomen if you combine a, a retro.